Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for Cancer Conversations, brought to you by UNC Leinberger's Comprehensive Cancer Center. Today, we'll be talking to Terry Mallow. I'm Jennifer Potter, and I'll be your moderator today. Dr. Mallow comes to us from the Carolina Screening Initiative, and she's going to speak with us about colorectal cancer. I want to bring your attention to the email address on your screen. Throughout the presentation, it will also be at the bottom of the screen. Please feel free at any time to email us questions. We're going to have some dedicated question and answer time at the end of the presentation. And I want to make sure that we get all of your questions or comments addressed. And I also want to bring the phone number to your attention. If at any time you have any technical questions, please don't hesitate to call us. It's 919-445-1000. With audio or visual questions, we'll be able to help you right away. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Malo. Okay. Thank you. I'm really pleased to be here today to be talking with you about colon cancer screening. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what, what is it and why should you have it. And this is a topic that's really near and dear to my heart because both of my grandparents on my mom's side of the family passed away from colon cancer. And so it's really important to me to be here and help other people to prevent colon cancer. So the plan today is to answer a few questions. Um, we'll talk about what is colon cancer, what is colon cancer screening, and why should you have it? And what are ways to lower your risk of getting colon cancer? So let's start with what is colon cancer? Well, cancer, yeah, well, let's talk about cancer for a minute. Uh, cancer is a mass of cells that has divided out of control and has grown more rapidly than normal. And so our bodies are made up of trillions of cells. And sometimes these cells grow out of control and form a lump or a mass. And lumps and masses are not necessarily cancer, but they can be cancer. So cancer, uh, like I said, cancer cells grow out of control. They kind of go haywire, and um, they also look and act differently than normal cells. So if you actually look at a cancer cell and a normal cell under a microscope, they're going to look different. And cancer can spread to other parts of the body. So it may start in one part of the body and go to another part of the body, and that's called metastasis. So we talked about cancer, let's talk about the colon. And I know for a lot of people this is going to be a uh, just a refresher, just, just to get us all on the same page and get us thinking about the colon. And so here's kind of a, a cartoonish image of a colon. And uh, the colon is part of the digestive system. And it's also called the large intestine. And this is really kind of, um, kind of the final stages that stool or poop passes through before it leaves the body. And so on the kind of left side of the picture of the colon, you'll see the cecum. And it's, it's the left side of the picture, but it's actually the right side of the body. And so the cecum is kind of where the handoff is between the small intestine and the large intestine. And then the colon goes kind of up and over and then down all the way to the sigmoid. And then you have the rectum. And the rectum is the last place that the stool or poop passes through before it comes out of the body through the anus. All right, so I talked about cancer. We talked about the colon. Let's talk about colon cancer. So in this picture, you'll see um, you polyps and cancer. And in that, in that uh, box that you see on the, the picture of the colon. This is just one area. It's just an example of where colon cancer can form. It can actually form anywhere in the colon or the rectum. And so um, there can be polyps and there can be cancer. And polyps are these sort of abnormal tissue growths and they form on the lining of the colon and they can be kind of kind of flattish, maybe a little bit rounded. They can also be these sort of mushroom-like stalks and um, like I said, they can form anywhere on the lining of the, the colon or the rectum, and it's the, they're, they're not necessarily cancerous. Um, a lot of times, actually, polyps are not cancerous, but we don't really know until we get to look at them more closely and take a sample of them. So, um, so we have polyps and then cancer that can form in the colon and rectum. And here are some pictures. We have polyps on the left side of your screen, and so you can really see in that top picture that that's more of your flattish, somewhat rounded polyp. And then in the bottom picture, you see those little mushroom-like stalks that I was talking about. 
And then on the right side of the screen, you can see a cancerous lesion, and you see that sort of darker red cluster of um, cancer there. I wanted to note that colon cancer is actually somewhat common, it's, and it's the second leading, leading cause of cancer death among men and women in North Carolina. And so, um, so it's, it's, a, it's really common and um, very important to know that screening can prevent colon cancer. So these colon cancer deaths are largely preventable through screening. And so that leads us to our next question, which is, what is colon cancer screening and why should you have it? So the first part of the question, you know, what is colon cancer screening? Well, screening is a way of looking for cancer in people who do not have symptoms. And I think this is really important to note because I've heard from people, you know, I didn't see any symptoms, I didn't see any blood in my stool, I didn't feel anything out of, you know, out of the norm. And, and that's the point of screening. You know, th by the time that you're experiencing symptoms, we're really talking about a diagnostic test to look for the cause of those symptoms. And by then, it's likely that the, the polyps and the cancer have, have been around for a little while by the time you see symptoms. So screening is really important for catching cancer and polyps early before you have symptoms. And I'm going to talk briefly about some recommendations. These are national recommendations for colon cancer screening. The United States Preventive Services Task Force recommends screening for colon cancer starting at age 50 years and continuing until age 75 years. Now you may have heard that the American Cancer Society released a different recommendation last year and the American Cancer Society recommends that adults aged 45 years and older with an average risk for colorectal cancer undergo regular screening. And what I wanted to point out here is that usually most insurance companies and Medicare are going to go with the task force's recommendation to start screening at age 50 years. And that doesn't mean that insurance plans aren't going to cover screening at a younger age, but they're not required to cover screening before age 50. So something to keep in mind. And you'll maybe notice that the American Cancer Society recommendation mentions average risk. Well, what is average risk? Well, people are at average risk of colon cancer if they do not have a personal or family history of colon cancer, if they do not have a personal history of inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease, if they don't have a confirmed or suspected hereditary colon cancer syndrome uh, like Lynch syndrome, and if they don't have a personal history of getting radiation to the belly or pelvic area to treat a prior cancer. And one thing I wanted to point out about that family history is that just because someone has a family member who had colon cancer, it doesn't necessarily mean they're at a higher risk for getting colon cancer. It really depends on who that family member was, whether they were a close relative or a more distant relative, and the age when they were diagnosed with cancer. So, um, so having a family history doesn't necessarily mean you're at high risk. You really need to talk with your doctor to find out more about your risk. All right, so we talked about average risk. Well, what if you're at increased or high risk of colon cancer? What does that mean? Well, it means your doctor may recommend that you start having colon cancer screening at an earlier age. Your doctor may also recommend that you get screened more often than normal. And they may recommend that you get a colonoscopy and not any of the other screening um, screenings for colon cancer that I'm going to talk about today. And so if, you're, if you think you might be at increased or higher risk for colon cancer, if you're, not, if you're not sure of your risk, I would recommend talking with your doctor to learn more about the best screening option and schedule for you. All right, so I mentioned that there are different screening tests for colon cancer, and, and you may be surprised to hear that there are different screening tests. And if, if you're surprised, that is totally normal. Um, there are... Um, kind of two main ways that people can get screened for colon cancer. One way is a stool-based test, and this test looks for hidden blood in a person's stool or poop. And what happens is if there are polyps or cancer in the colon or rectum, when stool passes by those uh, polyps or cancer, um, sometimes uh, since that tissue there is, is really fragile, 
the uh, they could release some blood into the stool. Not a lot. It's it's probably not going to be noticeable, and that's why we're talking about looking for hidden blood in a person's stool or poop. And by the way, I recently learned that some people refer to their toilet as the stool, and so that's why I have put poop in parentheses so that we we all know that I'm talking about poop here. Okay. And the other main way people can get screened for colon cancer is by a visual exam. And this test, is, this is where a doctor would use a scope or an x-ray to look at the colon and rectum for abnormal areas. All right, so I'm going to talk about six different colon cancer screening tests. And I wanted to note that not all of them may be available to you. Um, some of the tests are just not widely used, and some tests require special equipment and that equipment may not be available at facilities near you. So I just wanted to put that, put that out there before I start talking about the tests. So let's talk about the tests. We have uh, stool-based tests up first. I'm going to talk about the fecal immunochemical test, or the FIT, and this test is done once a year. And this is a test where you take a sample of your stool or poop at home using a kit that your doctor gives you. And there are different fit tests. So the picture shows two. And on the left side of the picture, you'll see a one sample fit. And you can see there's a tube and there's a spatula in there. And essentially what happens is you take the spatula and you kind of scrape some of the poop and put it into the, the tube. And then on the right side of the picture, you'll see a fit card. And with this fit card, you take you still take samples of your poop, but you take two samples and you smear them on, on a card and they come from the same bowel movement, the same poop. And so that's still um, you know, another way that you can get tested with the fit. And once you collect your sample, you can send it directly to a lab for the lab to process it and, and see if there's any hidden blood. Um, I think you, can all, you might also be able to bring it to your clinic and then your clinic can send it off for processing. You know, some people have said that they don't feel comfortable mailing poop in the mail, although, although it's okay to do so, but, but some people prefer to bring it to the clinic. Um, so like I said, this test is going to check for hidden blood in your stool or poop. And I wanted to say that hidden blood doesn't necessarily mean cancer. Sometimes people have, have blood in their stool from a hemorrhoid or something else. And so um, it could be that or it could be cancer. So it, what happens is that people who have a positive test, a, a positive test meaning that there was hidden blood in the poop, then the person will need a follow-up colonoscopy to see if there are polyps or cancer in the, in, the, um, in the colon or rectum. And I'll talk about a colonoscopy in just a bit. Um, the FIT test is often covered by insurance plans and by Medicare, and so I, but I would double check with, with uh, your health insurance before getting the test just to make sure. All right, so that's the FIT. I'm going to talk about the high sensitivity guaiac based fecal occult blood test, or FOBT for short. Mm -hmm. Next, it is also done once a year. And this is kind of similar to the FIT, except you take a sample of your poop from three separate bowel movements. And so it's like that FIT card, but you do it three times at home using a kit that your doctor gives you. And what's different about this test from the fit other than having to take the three samples is that you need to avoid certain foods like red meat and medicines like Advil or Aleve for a few days before the test because sometimes that makes your test look like it has blood in, uh, makes your stool look like it has blood in it and then it'll come back positive when it was actually not because of polyps or cancer, it was because of something else. So your doctor will tell you how many days that you need to avoid certain medicines or foods ahead of time before you do this test. And again, if this test is positive, you'll need a colonoscopy to see if there are polyps or cancer. And this test is usually covered by insurance and by Medicare. But again, if you're not sure, double check. All right, the last one, that last stool-based test is the multi-target stool DNA test. Um, it's, um, the only one on the market right now is Cologuard. You may have seen commercials on TV. There's a little talking box with arms and legs, and um, it comes, comes to your home. 
and this is done every three years and this is where you have a bowel movement in a container and you put a small sample of that stool into a separate tube. And so this is still looking for hidden blood in your stool, but it's also looking for abnormal DNA from polyps or cancer. Now, and if this test is positive, you'll also need a colonoscopy to see if there actually are polyps or cancer. And this test is covered by some insurances, but not all of them. And um, so I would double check with your insurance company before you have this test. All right, so those are all our stool-based tests. Let's talk about those visual exams. And the first one I'll talk about is the colonoscopy. I've already kind of hit on this one. Um, this test is done every 10 years, and it's done more often than that, than that if, it, if it turns out that you have polyps, and it really depends on how many polyps and the size of the polyps. But um, if, if you have had polyps, um, or cancer, then your doctor may recommend that you get it done more often than every 10 years. And um, with this test, a doctor uses a tube with a tiny camera and a tiny light at the end of it to go into the body, through the anus, into the rectum, into the colon, um, to look for cancer or polyps. The doctor can also use a, a tool through that tube to um, remove the polyps and remove the cancer and get a closer look at them. So, um, so it is kind of an invasive procedure and it does require that somebody takes a prep ahead of time that's usually a liquid laxative or it could be tablets, it could be a combination. Um, you'll get a prep kit and, and some instructions on how to complete it. And that is going to make your body um, eliminate any waste inside of the colon so that the doctor can get a clearer look and see if there are polyps or cancer. And so that means that uh, the prep is going to cause diarrhea and um, it's also known as watery stool. And so, so with the prep you'll need to stay pretty close to the bathroom. Um, and with the colonoscopy people also need to be sedated. So that means that somebody is going to have to take you to the, the facility where you're getting the colonoscopy and someone also has to take you home afterwards. It also means that you'll have to take some time off work if you're working. Um, usually one to two days, it kind of depends on the timing of your test, you know, the time of the day and, and kind of how much, uh, when you're doing the prep ahead of time, it might not be a good idea to be at work while you're um, doing your prep. And after the test, sometimes people are groggy, and so it could take several hours for that to kind of wear off, and so you definitely don't want to be operating heavy machinery or, um, or, or trying to do something that requires a lot of thinking because it just might not work out very well. But that also means you know, something else to keep in mind in, in, on top of needing to take some time off work is if you have um, if you care for others, including young children, you may have to find somebody who can, who can care for them while you're having this test. The test itself doesn't take that long. It takes about 30 minutes. But you know, just something to keep in mind that it's not just the 30 minutes that there's time that goes into the prep and then afterwards you're recovering from being sedated. And the colonoscopy is usually covered by Medicare and by insurance plans, but double check ahead of time if you're not sure. All right, colonoscopy, let's see, the next one is flexible sigmoidoscopy. This test is done every five years, and a doctor will use a tube with a tiny camera at the end, just like the colonoscopy, It'll use the, that tube with the camera and the light at the end. But it, you can see in the picture, it's not going through the whole colon this time. It's only going through the rectum and the sigmoid. And so um, it's only looking at part of the colon. And the day before the test, uh, this is similar to a colonoscopy, you'll have to follow a special diet, which is just clear liquids, and you also have to take an enema to clear out the, um, the colon so that the doctor can get a better look. And if this test is positive, then you'll need a colonoscopy, a full colonoscopy, to see if there are polyps or cancer, and this is because um, if there are polyps or cancer in this part of the colon, then there may be polyps or cancer in the rest of the colon, and you want to make sure that you're getting all of it checked out um, if there are some signs that there would be polyps or cancer. This test is usually covered by insurance plans and by Medicare, 
but um, it's not a widely available test, and so, so it may not be available to you. All right, the last test I'm going to talk about is the CT colonography. This is also called a virtual colonoscopy, and this one is done every five years. Um, a doctor uses an x-ray machine to look for polyps and cancer in your colon and rectum, and so you don't have to be sedated for this test. You can stay awake, and, um, but you'll still do a lot of the same things as the colonoscopy and the flexible sigmoidoscopy. You have to take a prep to empty out the colon. Again, this means you know diarrhea and needing to stay near a bathroom for a while to to um, yeah, to take care of that. And the te the the prep is emptying the colon so that a doctor can get a better look inside. Now, if this test is positive, you'll still need a colonoscopy to see if there are polyps or cancer, um, because you'll need to. Um, uh, the doctor needs to get a better look inside if, if there's some indication on the x-ray that there's pol that there are polyps or cancer. And so the, the doctor will perform a colonoscopy after this CT colonography at a separate visit usually, and then they'll be able to remove any polyps or cancer to get a better look at them if they're there. This test is usually not covered by insurance, and so that's something to keep in mind too. All right, so I talked about several different tests, and um, you may be thinking, well, how am I supposed to decide which test is right for me? And so I thought that it would be helpful to have kind of this list of different questions that you can ask yourself. And again, some of the tests might not be available, so that might, might um, narrow down your list a little bit. But you can think to yourself, you know, how concerned are you about having to collect samples of your stool? Some people, um, even though you're not really handling the stool or poop itself, you have a spatula or some sort of stick to, to get your sample, some people still are not comfortable with that. Um, so in that case, a, a FIT or FOBT or cold garden might not be right for you. And you can also ask yourself, how concerned are you about completing screening every year? Some of those tests require yearly screening, whereas others require screening every three or five or ten years. And so, you know, if, it, if it's hard to stick to a, a yearly schedule for screening, maybe those um, FOBT and FIT tests aren't right for you. Another thing you can ask yourself is, how concerned are you about completing a prep to empty the colon? Like I said, it's going to cause diarrhea and um, you know a lot of time spent near a bathroom, and so some people might not want to do that. Um, so in that case, those visual exams might not be right for you. And you can also ask yourself, how concerned are you about having an invasive procedure? Those visual exams are also invasive procedures, and in those cases, they're there's a low risk, but but it's still a risk that you know perhaps the the colon can get perforated in the, those procedures, and so um, you know, like I said, a small risk, but it's not a zero risk. So you know, thinking about how concerned you you are about that, and you can also ask yourself how concerned are you about taking time off work or away from family to complete screening, and finally you can ask. You know, how concerned are you about being sedated? Some people don't want to be sedated, and so in, in that case, you know, it can be, um, you know, maybe a FIT or FOBT or, or the Cologuard would be a better option. And so uh, those are some things that you can ask yourself, but also thinking about cost. Um, I mentioned that insurance and Medicare, um, most insurances and, and Medicare will cover the FIT, the FOBT, um, the colonoscopy and the flexible sigmoidoscopy. Insurance may cover Cologuard, and it probably doesn't cover the CT colonography. So if you're concerned about cost, you know, maybe you don't have insurance or if you are paying out of pocket, um, you know, thinking about the cost, it can be important too. The, the FIT-based tests, there are the stool-based tests, including the FIT and the FOBT, are probably going to be your least expensive options. Um, some of the other options, especially the visual exams, are going to be more costly. You know, it could be $1,000 or more paying out of pocket. And so keeping that in mind um, as you select a test could be helpful, too. All right, so and to kind of 
summarize and answer our question of why should you have colon cancer screening? Well, screening can help find polyps before they turn into cancer. And screening can find cancer early, before it has a chance to grow and spread. All right, I'm going to wrap up with what are ways to lower your risk of getting colon cancer? Uh, one way is to try to keep a healthy weight over time and lose weight if you're overweight or obese. There's been a connection between, um, studies have shown some connection between weight and colon cancer. Another way to lower your risk of colon cancer is to exercise. And this doesn't mean going to the gym. You, know, you can try walking for 30 minutes a day, walking your dog. Um, some people like swimming because it's um, a little bit easier on the joints. So there are other ways to exercise. Also, studies have, have shown that there might be a link between smoking and getting colon cancer, and so not smoking or quitting smoking might lower your risk of colon cancer. And studies have also shown a link um, between drinking and alcohol getting colon cancer, and so limiting yourself to one drink a day if you're a woman or two drinks a day if you're a man may lower your risk of colon cancer. And then finally, you can lower your risk of getting colon cancer by eating a diet that's high in fruits and vegetables and limiting the amount of bread and processed meats that you eat. All right, so just to recap, we answered a few questions today, including what is colon cancer, what is colon cancer screening, and why should you have it, and what are ways to lower your risk of getting colon cancer. And I'll end with this saying that the best colon cancer screening test is the one that gets done. Um, this means that there are several different screening options and they all have pros and cons that we've talked about. But at the end of the day, the important thing is to get screened. So with that, I'll say thank you for this opportunity to talk with you about colon cancer screening and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Malu. I'm sure um, our audience appreciates your time just as much as I do. It was wonderful. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I just wanted to, uh, again, point out our email for questions. It's cc at med.unc.edu, and they will pop up right here, and we'll answer them for you the best of our ability. But while we're waiting for questions, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, some of the most common barriers that you see for people not wanting to get a colorectal cancer screening, like fear or... Um, you did a great job touching on financial concerns, but what do you see as a researcher? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that one of the, the things, one of the barriers that we see come up is, is um, transportation issues. And so some people are in rural areas of the state or, or other areas where it's just they're, they're not very close to a health facility. And so um, I, that's when I think that certain tests like the FIT or FOBT or the Cologuard, you know, tests that you can do at home are a great um, screening option if transportation is an issue because you can do them at home and mail them off to a lab for processing and then you'll get your results either by letter or phone call. And so I think that those might be good options. Um, some people have been... Um, a little bit concerned about being sedated, going, going under anesthesia, um, and so, so maybe not doing a colonoscopy as your first test. I know that I said that if any of the other tests are positive, then you'll need to do a colonoscopy so that a doctor can get a better look at the polyps or cancer that might be inside the colon and rectum. But maybe as your first test, you can do a FIT or FOBT or, or Cologuard, um, one of those stool-based tests. Great. And we do have um, one question that came in. Um, what would you say to someone who says that they don't need colon colorectal cancer screening because no one in their family has ever had colon cancer? Yeah, that's, um, well, that's great that no one in the family has had colon cancer, but it doesn't mean that um, that that person won't get colon cancer. I think family history is just one piece of it, and that would that would maybe mean that that person would be at higher risk for colon cancer, but it doesn't mean um, that if you don't have a family history that you don't have a risk. Like I said, colon cancer is, is pretty common. It's the second leading cause of cancer deaths in, in men and women in North Carolina. And so I think just emphasizing that they don't um, need to have a family history to, to be at risk. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And um, if you do have questions that pop into your head later today, feel free to still submit them and we'll do our best to answer them. 
um, wanted to bring your attention to our Cancer Conversations next month. It will be on Friday, April 26th at the same time, uh, 12 to 1 p.m., and we're going to have a um, talk about understanding clinical trials, what they are, um, what it looks like to be a participant in one, the safety measures that are in place, and we'll also have opportunity to answer any of your questions then. So um, thank you again for joining us today, and thank you so much, Dr. Mala. This was wonderful. Well, thank you for having me. You I did really a very great job. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes. Thank you.